Law Enforcement Sunday is this weekend, and uh, we want to take a moment in our services this weekend to express our deep gratitude and appreciation to all of you that have or are serving uh, in law enforcement in any capacity. Uh, we do not take you for granted. Uh, we do not take your, your dedication, your service, and your sacrifice for granted. Uh, we love you. We believe in you. Our prayers are with you, and we know it's never been a more difficult time than now to serve. What's interesting to me theologically is in the book of uh, Romans chapter 13, those that are in law enforcement in the military, you are called ministers of God. There's not too many people or too many individuals in the Bible that are actually referred to that way, but that is a term that Paul used in Romans 13. You can read it for yourself. Uh, ministers of God. You do not bear the sword in vain, and you execute wrath on evildoers. That's what the great the greatest Christian that's ever lived, that's how he describes what you do. So we, we salute you, and uh, we thank you. And oh, by the way, I almost forgot. Uh, we have a gift of appreciation that we would like to uh, present to you. So if you are in law enforcement, stop by Guest Connections on your way out. Uh, I did talk with my staff. If some of you are undercover, uh, narcotics, and uh, you may not look like a cop on the outside, uh, you might need to show your badge. <laughs> okay. Uh, Wow, we're going to be starting a new series called Words Create Worlds in two weeks, in two weeks. Uh, so we, we have a special message that I want to bring to you this weekend. Uh, and the next weekend, we have a very, very, very special guest that's going to be with us as we celebrate the sanctity of human life. Uh, you're not, uh, I guarantee me, I guarantee you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, the title of my message uh, this weekend, God is in control. God is in control. I want to give you a clear word in a murky world. We live in a murky world, <laughs> and I want to give you a clear word. So out of love and respect, please stand for the reading of God's Word, two verses of Scripture. The first one, 1 Chronicles 29:11. Yours is the mighty power and glory and victory and majesty. Everything in the heavens and earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as being in control of everything. And in the book of Job, chapter 25, verse 2, God is the one to fear because God is in control and rules the heavens. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful for the Holy Spirit through the inspired Word of God, reminding us this weekend in all of our services, yours is the mighty power and the glory and the victory. And Lord, we thank you that you are sovereign over your creation and your kingdom. And we adore you because you are in control of everything. You rule over the heavens. Remind us of that. May this truth be driven into our hearts and souls. We pray and ask now in the names of every name, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, you may be seated. I want to wish my oldest son, Nathan, happy birthday. Today is his birthday. God is in control. Two famous quotations which I think are appropriate for the moment we find ourselves living in right now. The first is, there is no such thing as a sure thing. Now, that would probably capture the sentiment of most people around the world as we closed out 2020, right? Uh, no such thing as a sure thing. And as this year has kicked off, uh, we, we can all agree there is no such thing as a sure thing. COVID, this uh, pandemic, has really ushered in some strange things, uh, to say the least. I mean, just think of socialistic control over a large segment of our citizenry, as we see in states throughout our country. It's ushered in a major political shift towards a more socialistic state control of our lives, and it has really been revolutionary. And so there is no such thing as a sure thing. And the second famous quote that I want to share with you, the only thing you can be sure of 
is that there's nothing that you can be sure of. Benjamin Franklin once said, our new constitution is now established and has an appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, this is Benjamin Franklin, but in this world nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. And the truth of the matter is, even those things aren't certain. Jesus could return tonight, and we will escape death. So not even death is certain. And as I understand it, uh, taxes aren't certain. If you live in Monaco or the Dominican Republic or Bermuda or the Cayman Islands, uh, you don't pay any taxes, as I understand. Might be a good place to retire. I don't know. So we've come full circle to the questions. Is there any such thing as a sure thing? Is there anything you can count on? Is there anything that you can take to the bank? Is there a clear word in a murky world? And I believe there is. And I believe that it's given to us here in Scripture, in, in, in the two verses of Scripture that we looked at. First Chronicles 29, 11, once again, it says, we adore you, the latter part of that verse, we adore you as being in control of everything. Think of that. Think of those four words, in control of everything. In control, Scripture says, whether you feel like it or not, whether it seems like it or not, God is in control of everything. The ship may be in a storm right now, but the captain of our salvation, God Almighty, is guiding us and the ship to its intended pre-planned destination. The ship of this world and of humanity itself, it is being ultimately guided and directed by the hand of God. So whether we want to admit it or not, God is in control of everything, and that means, and here's the good news, God's in control of your life, and God's in control of my life. Matter of fact, God's been in control of our lives before we drew our first breath. Wow. And then the emphasis on the, for this microphone. <laughs> See, you didn't choose where you, you, where you would be born. You didn't choose that. It was chosen for you. You didn't choose when you were to be born. You didn't choose who you were to be born to. You didn't choose your nationality. You didn't choose your talents, abilities, gifts, skills, interests, or even your personality. We are all literally filled with designer genes. And I'm not talking about the kind that you get at Neiman Marcus or the Gucci store. Now, I don't know a more clear word in a murky world and the murky times that we live in than those four words. God is in control. <laughs> and then I felt the Holy Spirit tell me this as I was writing the message. When you are out of control, you are not trusting that God is in control. When you and I run around like our heads on fire, that says one thing. You're not trusting that ultimately God is in control. He's got your back. It's according to His plan and schedule, and we have to trust Him with all of our hearts that God is in control. And to the degree that we can trust that God is in control, we ourselves will remain in control. Now, because of that, there are three things I can absolutely, positively, certain with certainty, certainty tell you that you can count on in this new year. No matter what the economy does, no matter what the politicians do, no matter what happens in the far-flung regions of the world, China, North Korea, Iran, or any other hot spot around the world, these three things are absolutely sure. And if you're taking notes, you're going to want to write them down. And here's the first one. God has a plan. Let's say that together. God has a plan. Because He's in control of everything, you and I can be assured of one thing. A certain word in uncertain times. God has has a plan. Look at Proverbs 19, 21. Let's read this out loud together. We make a lot of plans, but the Lord will do what he has decided. <laughs> there are times that God has the veto power to overturn and overrule any decision that we make, any decision that a nation makes, any decision that the world makes. Time and time again in the Bible, men would make decisions and we are 
free moral agents. We have free volition. We can make choices that are contrary to God's will for our lives. But if we interfere in the, the ultimate sovereign plan and will of God, God will intervene. God will stop it, as he did at the Tower of Babel. So God has a plan. That's the one thing, because he's in control of your life and in my life, he's in control of everything, we can be assured that God has a plan. What does Jeremiah 29, 11 says? says I, God says, I know the plans I, ha- the plans I have for you, to give you peace and, and, and to, to give you not evil. Uh, God has a plan for our lives. Now, my heart's been heavy over what's been transpiring in our nation, not just over the last several weeks, but really the last... 10 years, to be quite frank with you, 10 or 15 years. And uh, I love our country. I love America. I am very, very patriotic. Perhaps, though, we're at a place where we can no longer save America, but we can still save Americans. And so our mission doesn't change. Uh, We may not be able to save America, but we can save those living in America. And not just Americans. You know, God loves the entire world. And we want uh, all to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Walter Lippmann wrote a book, The Public Philosophy. He said this, When Shakespeare was alive, there were no Americans. When Virgil, that Roman poet, was alive, there were no Englishmen. And when Homer, the Greek poet, was alive, there were no Romans. And Os Guinness wrote, God can afford to do without the United States and Europe. His kingdom can survive the collapse of the West as it did of Rome. Now, friend, I I hope you and I will not be the eyewitnesses of the collapse of Western civilization as we know it today. But Europe could end and America could end. But the kingdom of God will continue and the church of Jesus Christ will thrive and continue to grow. You see, biblical pro-life, pro-marriage, pro-freedom values are losing ground in the United States of America. I don't listen to country western music, but when I saw what was going on in Georgia, I don't know, I, I've never listened to this song all the way through, but this song from Charles, Charlie Daniels came to my mind, the devil, down in, the devil went down to Georgia. <laughs> so I looked it up on YouTube. I still couldn't listen to it all the way through, but I got the gist of it. The devil went down <laughs> to, to Georgia. Please, I hope you understand, this is not blue or red. It's not Republican or Democrat. This is life and death. This is good and evil. And uh, this is not uh, American against American. It's uh, values that I hope all Americans would value what is good. And what is good is the birth of children. What is good is the sanctity of life and the womb of every woman. It's not some political thing. It's a life and death thing. It's a good and evil thing. It's a heaven and hell thing. And after all legal and peaceful means have been exhausted, here's what we know. As of today, four four words, God is in control. God is in control. You know, there was a time that Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. Could you picture that? Towards the end of his ministry, right before Passion Week, Christ went outside the city, looked down on the city, and God wept. Actually, there are three places in the Bible where Jesus wept. Jesus looked over the city of Jerusalem, and he wept. And there are times I have shed tears for our nation. Why did Jesus weep over Jerusalem? Because she did not recognize the moment in time, the kairos, the God moment. The opportunity of a lifetime, the opportunity for that city to be saved and all the inhabitants to be saved, but because Jerusalem rejected God's plan, God had to reject Jerusalem. And Jesus knew that in one generation, this beautiful city would be destroyed, the temple would be destroyed, the walls would be destroyed, and no one would inhabit this land for 2,000 years until May of 1948. When supernaturally and miraculously, the nation of Israel was born in a day, a sign of prophecy, my friend, that ushered in the last of the last days that happened in this past century. We could weep over, perhaps, the death of a nation now. I hope not. 
and despise the knots that are all tangled up in our country today. You know one thing I hate? I hate knots. Um, I picked my mom up, you know, uh, to bring her over to the house for a Christmas meal, and she had a necklace, and uh, she, it was all knotted up. You know how those, the chains on the necklace get all knotted up? And she, bless her heart, she was trying to get it all unknotted. So I said, here, give, give it to me. We, we got to the house, and I said, here, give it to me. I'll, I'll do this. I'm like, I hate knots. You know, I, is there a trick? Like, I wanted to go to YouTube, you know. Like, there's got to be a hack to knots, you know, getting a knot out. You know, uh, I just, I don't like knots. And uh, it takes a while to untangle the knots. Alexander Sotonitsin note, notioned, uh, mentioned about knots. He said, those divisive, excuse me, decisive, historic moments in which everything is rolled up and tied in a knot. And that's what's happening right now. Everything's, everything's knotted up. Everything is rolled up, and everything is tied into a knot. But God's in the business of, of uh, untying those knots. Does you feel like maybe your, your life right now is knotted up? Maybe your marriage is knotted up? Maybe your finances are knotted up? Uh, God's in the business of denotting those knots. Amen. <laughs> if, if we'll let him. See, God has a plan. And God's plan is, is a bigger plan than you and I can presently see. I mean, just look back over the times in your life when God changed your plans. How many of you, there have been moments in your life where God changed your plans? Raise your hand, okay? Uh, there are a lot of us, a lot of us who didn't marry the first person we thought we were going to marry. Don't look so guilty <laughs> or innocent, right? Many of us in this room make a living right now doing something totally different than what we thought we were going to do. How many of you are doing something totally different than you thought you were going to do? Raise your hand. Absolutely. When I was 16 years old, I thought when I graduate from high school, I'm going to Las Vegas, Nevada, because we had family that owned a casino, the Barbary Coast, Frank Toady. I said, uh, distant relative, but still a toady. I said, I'm going to show up, and I'm going to be a car dealer, then I'm going to be a pit boss, and then I'm going to one day own a casino. That was my high aspiration for my life. And then I got saved. And God said, that ain't going to work, son. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> and sometimes we wonder, well, how do I know if what I'm doing is God's will? Two things. Can you love God by doing it? Is it, is it loving God and is it helping people? Just two things. I love what St. Augustine said to Christians. St. Augustine said this. Love God, do whatever you want. You know, as a Christian, you could do whatever you want as long as it falls under those two categories. You can love God by doing it, and you're helping others. You can love God and help others. But God has a plan for our lives, and God wants to reveal that plan in our lives. But many times God has different plans than we have. And sometimes you want to make God laugh, tell Him your plan. <laughs> right? And what we need to do, we need to surrender that plan and uh, allow God to take that plan, tear it up, and then give us His plan for our lives. And yes, we should have plans, absolutely. We should set goals, absolutely. But we should be, we should be uh, flexible. We, we should be agile. We should not be so rigid and, and, and so hardcore and so focused on one thing that we don't allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. And sometimes God guides us through closed doors that we can't open, and then new doors that are opening up. Look at what, here's how Proverbs says it in Proverbs 16, 9. Let's read it out loud together. No? Proverbs 16, 9. Well, let me read it out loud for you. <laughs> May not have added it to the notes. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. A man's heart plans his way, but it's it's the Lord that directs our steps. And the psalmist said, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Isn't it wonderful to know your steps are ordered of the Lord? God, have your way. That's why one of the most important prayers we could pray is, Lord, not my will, but your will be, be done. So you and I have to trust that the Lord is directing our steps, and we don't want to get ahead of God. We want to be in sync. We want to be in step with God. Uh, too often we, we look at God and, and we say, Bless what I'm doing when we ought to be saying, God, help me to do what you're going to bless. God, help me to do and help me to know what I am to do that you are going to bless. And then you and I could take comfort 
You know, we make all our elaborate plans and goals, set our goals, and all, our new, all of our new year resolutions, right? You and I could rest that ultimately God is in control, and if we surrender to His will and we want His will above all else, then you'll have nothing less than that will, if that's what you want above all else. So number one, God has a plan. Number two, God has a hand in my problems. Not only does God have a plan, but God has a hand in my problems. Now, let's look at Genesis 50 and verse 20. The evil you planned to do to me has by God's design been turned to good to bring about the present result, the survival of a numerous people. This is how Joseph looked at all the injustices, all of the betrayal, all of the pain of his life. His brothers, his own brothers, sold him as a slave, right? He, uh, to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt and he, he worked as a slave and was falsely accused and went to prison and then he ends up being the second most powerful man in the world. And in the process, it, it may have seemed as though God was uh, the furthest thing away from Joseph, that his plan, his dream, and his heart would never be fulfilled. And I love this translation, the New Jerusalem Bible. It says, the evil you plan. You know, sometimes the devil and people plan evil against you. Plan evil against God's house, against God's kingdom, against the work of Christ. There are those that have a plan, a plan to do harm, a plan to do evil. But the evil you plan to do to me has, by God's design, been turned to good. I'm here to tell you the evil that the enemy has meant for your life, God's going to turn it by His design for His glory and for your good. I declare that in Jesus' name. Another translation reads this way, Genesis 50, verse 20. As for you, it was in your mind to do me evil, but God has given a happy outcome. Oh, don't you like that? As for you, it was, it was in your mind you were scheming to hurt me and to do evil. But God, I love those two words. I'm going to do a sermon here pretty soon, but God. <laughs> Just two words. Uh, the Bible in two words, but God. Gave you the Bible in three words at the end of worship. The Bible in two words, but God. I'll tell you what, the whole world could be against you, but God. The bottom could be falling out from under you, but God. You could have gotten the worst news of your life, but God, hallelujah. Okay, I'll preach it now if you don't watch it. But God, God has given a happy outcome. How many of you right now in your life are believing for a happy outcome in your life, your family, the situation you're going through? There is one there somewhere, somewhere, for our, even for our nation. There is, there is a somehow, some way, there is a happy outcome. So the question always is asked, if, if God is good and all-powerful, why are there so many problems in the world? Fair question, I guess. Why is there so much evil in the world? If God is all-powerful, why are things happening, and why have things happened that are so evil, like the Holocaust, or world hunger, or someone's loved one getting cancer and dying? This global pandemic. Where's God in all of this? If God is in control of everything, how can we trust God if we really don't know what he's up to? Well, that's what trust is really all about, friend, is trusting that God is good, number one. God is good because God is love, and God has a plan. And there is world in this evil. So an answer to this deep question was actually found by a guy named Basil Mitchell in the parable of the resistance fighter that came out of World War II. Listen to this. Very profound. Imagine I come to you in a bar one night and said, I gather you want to join the resistance. I am the local resistance leader. We'll talk for two hours tonight. If you put your trust in me and join the resistance, we'll never talk live Again, it's too dangerous. Sometimes you'll know exactly what I'm doing. It'll be obvious. Sometimes you won't. I might be in a Gestapo uniform 
arresting one of our own. You won't know that I am in disguise. And you'll need to know that I am in disguise, realizing that once we get out of sight, I'm going to release him or her because the real Gestapo are right around the corner and about to arrest them. You have to trust. But at the end of the war, when the codes are broken and all of the secrets are explained, then we'll know why everything happened. Child of God, we look through a glass darkly now, and we don't see as clearly in a murky world as we would like to see, but that's why we have to trust God. And prophecy is a sure word, a certain word in uncertain times. And we can trust that though we may not understand God's ways, God has a plan, and God is good. And at the end, God's plan will be fulfilled. One thing we all know as we face a new year is that we're all going to have problems. As a matter of fact, I can guarantee you are going to have problems this year. If you don't already have problems, you're going to have problems because every year brings new problems. Every month brings new problems. Every week brings new problems. Sometimes it seems like every day and every moment of every day brings new problems. It seems like people come into your life and they present on your plate the Moby Dick of problems every, uh, every other day. And you'll be famous for the problems you cause and the problems you solve. May we be more in the problem-solving business than in the problem-causing business. Can I get an amen in the house of God? There's something I want to remind you concerning whatever challenges or problems you are or will face or the evil that's in our world that we may not understand, the, the ins and the outs, the who's, the what's, and the why's. Three things, three thoughts. God causes it, God allows it, or God will use it. Sometimes God causes it, not evil, but He uses it. Sometimes God allows it, evil that is, friend. But God will always use it. So you know what that means? One of the most important components of our automobiles, of our engines, is an oil filter. And there are some ladies out there saying, what's that? You need to get it changed regularly, darling. (laughs) The oil filter is needed in the car because what it does is it uh, keeps the impurities that could get into the engine, that could damage the engine, and it filters them out. It's a You know, that filter is designed to keep all that oil as clean as possible so that the engine will be lubricated and run smoothly like it was meant to. Heavenly Father, our Father, the Holy Spirit, is like this divine supernatural oil filter that's going to take everything that comes our way and it's going to filter out the impurities. Someone actually once said, the, the Bible in three words justification, sanctification, glorification. And uh, sometimes we're in that process of sanctification, and sometimes we're going through a pressure cooker. We're in a pressure cooker. Sometimes the gold must go through the furnace, and, and, and the, the dross must be purged from the silver, and there's a process, and we have to trust God during that time and know that He is good. I didn't say everything that happens to you is God's will. I did not say that, and I am not saying that. Listen to me. Not everything that happens to you is God's will. God does not cause everything that happens. There is a difference in what God causes to happen and what God allows to happen. But in the end, we trust God is love, and God is good. And I may not understand right now what might be happening in my life or in the world, but I know God is in control, and God loves me, and God is for me, and God's not against me, and God has a plan, and I'm part of that plan, and you're part of that plan. Whether God causes something to happen like the crucifixion of His own Son, where Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only time he ever referred to the Father as God, he cried out for his own Father's mercy. 
When in that moment of time, God had to turn away from his own son because in that moment he had become sin. The sin of the entire world was placed upon him as he hung upon that cross. Whether God causes something to happen such as the crucifixion or God allows something to happen such as the apostle Paul in prison, God can take a crucifixion and turn it into a resurrection and God can take a jail cell and turn it into a publishing house so that half the New Testament is written. Hallelujah. That's the goodness of our God. What the world might mean for evil, God can use for your good and his glory. To put it all another way, all of our problems, friend, has, they have a purpose. Every single one of them. Sometimes we have to wait until the war is over and all is decoded and all is revealed. And when we get to heaven, every question in your heart will be answered and it will all make sense then. Maybe not now, but that's okay. We don't have to have all the answers because we have God's promises. I said we don't have to have all the answers because we have God's promises. And God's promises, hallelujah, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one of his promises in his word will ever, ever fall short. God has a plan. God has a hand in our problems, the unseen hand of God guiding. And finally, number three, God hears my prayers. Let's say that together. God hears my prayers. This, this verse is going to rock your world. Isaiah 65, 2. Let's read it out loud together. Because you answer prayers, people everywhere will come to you. Oh, I love that. That is so profound. That is so rich. It's so majestic. Because, God, you answer prayers, people everywhere are going to come to you. Maybe everything needs to be set up so that there is a true third awakening in the United States of America and a true revival in the church of God that will become an outpouring of the power and grace of God in a nation just maybe, I don't know if we deserve it or not, just maybe God will give the United States of America one more chance to come back to him. But either way, God hears our prayers and people everywhere are going to come to him. What a statement. God hears our prayers. And whatever else that means, it has to mean this, that when you and I pray, it's no waste of time. And that prayer does make a difference. That's why, oh, I love the book of Daniel and all that, the revelation that came to Daniel, it came by way of prayer and fasting, but Daniel prayed three times a day. I just want to encourage all of us in this new year, friend, please, I beseech you, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, let's make prayer and let's make praying a priority. Amen. Can we give a witness of that by clapping our hands? The effectual, effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5, 16 says. James was the half-brother of Jesus. James, who wrote the book of James. The half-brother of Jesus. And he understood the power of prayer. Prayer works because God works. And prayer is powerful. You see, friend, you can't control your spouse. You can't control your kids. You can't control your boss. You can't control so many things in life, but you can control how you react and how you respond to life. And to be in control sometimes means we have to let go of trying to be in control. Give it to God. I think, I think that's what prayer is about. You know, people are telling me, we need to be praying for these elections. I said, no, we need to be voting in these elections. <laughs> Forget praying. You don't believe in prayer? Yes, but it's not like we're trying to, oh God, we're trying to talk you in, you know, you know trying to talk you into helping elect people that, that love life, you know, I'm going to defend life. I mean, God's for us. What we should be praying is, God, wake up the church and wake up Christians so that they would go out and exercise their duty to vote. <laughs> you see? Because then if it doesn't happen, we like to blame God. Well, it must, have been, must not have been God's will. Prayer works and prayer is powerful. At the end of the day, prayer isn't trying to get God to do what we want Him to do. 
Prayer is trying to get us to do what God wants us to do. Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. Amen. And prayer isn't trying to control God, to get him to do what we want as much as it is giving God control. Yes, Lord, your will be done. God, I give you control. Lord, Lord, you know, have your way. You know, friends, sometimes we overestimate what we can control and we underestimate what we can't. We overestimate what we can control. We underestimate what we can't. We can give God control over. What areas of your life right now are you trying to control that God is saying, release that to me. Give that to me. Give God control. There's a book called The Healing Touch. Norma, Norma Deering wrote that book. And in that book, she gives a metaphor that others have used, but hers is quite interesting as she outlines it in, uh, in her, her book. She says, uh, let's say one day you're, you're, you're driving along the journey of life and you see Jesus on the side of the road. Now, most of us, you know, as Christians, right, we would stop and we would, we would pick up Jesus. But here's how her, her metaphor, her illustration uh, gets very convicting. Most, most Christians would stop and we like to put Jesus in the trunk because, you know, we don't want to be seen with Jesus after all, right? What that might communicate to the community or to the neighbors, you know, or to the people we're trying to impress. And then, you know, we kind of treat Jesus like a spare tire. You know, we, he, he's there in case of an emergency. And then sometimes, you know, people will actually uh, get, become a little daring and they will invite Jesus at the next stop to get in the back seat. And then as we have conversation with Jesus in the, in the, in the journey of life, you know, uh, then we're like, whoa, this is, this is kind of nice. This is kind of fun. Hey, why don't you move on up? Next stop, Jesus. Why don't you, you know, ride shotgun? And then we get a little bit more comfortable in our relationship, you know, and, and uh, now he's, thank God, he's out of the trunk. He's, he's now out of the back seat. Now he's in the shot. And then the next stop, we're like, you know, Jesus, it seems as though my life is not going in the direction I wanted to go. And, and Jesus simply says, because I need to be in the driver's seat. <laughs> and what we need is we need to make sure that Jesus, if we want him to be in control of our life, we need to make sure that Christ is in the driver's seat. When it comes to your life, your marriage, your health, your finances, your choices, your decisions, are you making them? Or are you seeking God and God's wisdom, God's counsel and the leading of the Holy Spirit? Are you allowing Christ to be at the center of your life? Are we allowing Christ to be in the driver's seat of our life, to truly give him control over everything? And what a much better way to live our life, worry-free, to literally be without any anxiety, as the Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request, requests be made known unto God. Anxious for nothing. Don't worry about tomorrow. Jesus told us that. God's going to take care of you. If he feeds the birds of the air and clothes the lilies of the valley, will he not care for you? O oh, ye of little faith, may we trust not in our own ability, but in God's ability. And may our prayer be, God, have your way. Be in control of every aspect of my life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we humbly come before you tonight in, in our weekend services. And wow, we ask God, be in control. If, if you're not in control, be in control. If there's something I'm trying to control, Lord, is that great serenity prayer has been spoken a million times it was it's been spoken once god help me to change the things i can't accept and accept the things i cannot change and god give me the grace to know the difference there's things that lord can change in my life and with your help i can change them. there are things i can't change but god i i surrender and i give those things over to you and lord may our prayer be the prayer that you prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but your will be done. And may we truly surrender, knowing that you are good, 
and what we can't understand, it's not meant for us to understand, for the secret things belong unto the Lord, and what He chooses to reveal, He will reveal to us and to our children. And the things that have not yet been revealed to us, Lord, we're going to trust you because we know your love and we know you're good. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here in our service and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior or you need to rededicate your life to Christ, oh, what a better way to start out this new year than to come back into fellowship with the Lord for those of you that have been backslidden or to accept Christ for those of you that have never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. And Jesus said you must be born again. You must confess your sins, and you must confess Christ as Lord, and you must surrender your heart to him. You say, well, how do I do that? I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And the rest of the congregation's, congregation is going to pray this prayer out loud with you. But it's so important that you say this prayer with your own mouth and mean it from your own heart. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart, come into my life, be my Lord, and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit, and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we thank the Lord together, church family?